One of the projects that we're putting together for Burning Man this year is called The Passage. It's going to be an enclosed area. Inside is going to be probably a chair and a video screen, audiovisual, maybe some design inside, but probably just dark except for the screen. A place where you sit down and you are just given a very direct message that, in essence, shakes you from your socialized perspectives and wakes you up to a rebirth. A rebirth and experiencing the now as blissful heaven. Kind of an ambitious and daunting task. It, it's similar in, in scope and intention as uh, one of my favorite books, The Book. The Book by Alan Watts. The Book on the Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. Ooh, man. Because that's, I think, what we're trying to do with this project, is trying to kind of shine a light on some of the beliefs that keep us bound to thought patterns or goals or just socialized patterns that really make us miss out on, on who we are and what life has to offer. Even, even the, just the, the, the very simple things in life can be missed, can be pushed aside in, on this quest for the grand when you, when you don't have a sense of what you are and what all this is. So, in, 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 in this book, Alan Watts talks about, he starts the book by saying, you know, in, in, in older times, especially in, in uh, Japanese cultures, I believe, that there, during a wedding day, a book was handed down from the parents to the child that was, it was filled with all sorts of, like, like a Kama Sutra, all sorts of lovemaking diagrams and stuff. Kind of like, here's the things that we can't talk about, but you need to know. And he says, well, what is those things now? I mean, clearly sex is not quite the taboo it once was, but what is the taboo? Really, the taboo is about understanding who you are in the world. We have these, this elaborate socialized construct about what success is and what the point is. But when you think about it, what success is and what the point is, as we're living and as we, as we act and do, if you look around and look at our culture and our media, what is the goal? The goal is to achieve the goal is to climb. The goal is to acquire power, power, fame, success. That is what we're all driving for. And yet, what do we all know? Common sense, as well as every example we can hear. What, do, what does everybody say on their deathbed? Basically, I wish I didn't follow those rules. I wish I didn't strive for those things. I wish I didn't listen to that definition of success. And I wish instead I would have spent more time with family, in love, following my pursuits, not being so worried about what other people thought, wearing more bright colors. I think I would start by saying the, the beginning of this process of going from not knowing to knowing is, is the understanding that you cannot trust your thoughts and beliefs. For the first 20 years, actually for our entire lives, we are constantly in the classroom being inundated with programming from our culture about what success is, about what beauty is, about what respect is, about what is unacceptable, about what is shameful. I mean, we consider, you know, showing a breast shameful, but cheating and lying to be only, only unacceptable if you get caught. What? Who on their deathbed says, I wish I would have lied more? And, I mean, it's crazy. The fact that we don't have built in. We have a measuring stick of success that is financial, power, fame based. We do not necessarily, unless you dig very deep or go to very specific communities. We do not have a measuring stick of righteousness, of, of love. Someone was talking recently and they were saying how hard it is uh, to kind of be focused on things like doing the right thing. We just have so few examples of, of role models. And I was thinking, I'm like, you know what? The bummer about the people who discover that bliss and joy is in a humble life, in a life of service, in a life of love and humility, those people don't have PR machines working for them. They do not 
turn on neon signs saying, look at me. They don't crave fame. They don't get on TV. They don't spread the word. It's kind of like, it's unfortunately, it's an evolutionary um, negative. It's kind of like if you were a person who, you know, you had the trend that you didn't like uh, to, you didn't like sex, well then you would stop having children. And if you have the trait that you don't need fame, well then you don't spread the word. And so the, the, I think the greatest teachers our world has to offer are hidden. Hidden amongst nature, hidden away from the cities, hidden offline as they go deeper into their connection. Now, the Bodhisattva model of someone who finds enlightenment and then comes back and tries to teach it to us, um, even that person, I think, is, is, is not given the star fame status that our culture demands for someone to be listened to. We listen to people if they have enough cameras on them. People become famous for being famous, not because of the incredible acts they do. Otherwise, we would have, you know, Real House Calcutta. So, this process of socialization creates an ego self that is very future-focused, very security-craving, very separate-feeling, and really steered into the identity and role of a consumer. Within the big system, that makes sense. In, in the system of a commercial capitalist world, the individual worker bees need to be consumers. But our goal isn't to be a functioning part of a consumer capitalist world. Our goal is to be alive. Our goal is to step into the experience of consciousness and receive the gift now, if, if the gift of consciousness is to be really embraced, then we have far less needs for stuff, far less needs, holes in ourselves that we need to fill with products and purchasing. So the system is, that's why the lessons of the system are trying to create this person that needs security. So we need to acquire stuff. Now, here's a, here's a little side note for those of you who are acquiring security and maybe you've got a down payment on a house and maybe you've got something in the bank. Those are great. But none of it gives you security. Natural disasters, illness, accidents, those things hit everybody regardless of how much planning you have, no matter how much you've been tending to your 401k and your stock portfolio. All those things do is, at best, give you resources to have experiences. At worst, they actually create a prison where you feel bound to these things that you need, to this debt that you have, to this, this visual of what you perceive happiness to look like, what you perceive peace to look like. We go, as a kid, we play. We're in the now. Whether it's pain or anger or joy, it's all now, 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 now. And then as we grow and we socialize and our brains develop and as well as our cultural status quo position gets defined, we get pulled out of the now dramatically. And so everything that we got taught gets turned into a future focus, whether it's, oh, this is going to go on your permanent record. You start thinking about your grades. You start, you start gearing from your preschool. What, what kind of private school is that going to get you into? What's that going to get you into your high school? What that's going to get you into your college? And so you, you're always start, you start looking towards goals. Start looking towards future things. And the end game of this future, 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 I guess, is that you eventually either get enough that you're secure and you can then relax and become present again, or eventually you retire. And then you can once again become present again and simply be and fish and experience the now. But you've got this huge chapter of your life, 65 years or so, where we get pulled out of the now with the only, I mean, with no real understanding of why to get, 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 get. And unfortunately, because unless you define in advance, okay, when I get $100,000, when I get $500,000, when I get a million dollars, that's when I know I've got enough that I'll feel safe. No one does that. And so what you do is you never feel safe because you've trained yourself to have a mindset of not enough, not enough, not enough. And not enough doesn't have a number on it. Not enough is forever. Not enough 
is the carrot on the stick that no matter how many steps you take, it gets moved that far away. So here's, here's the big breakdown of that system. If we're present when we're, one to, when we're five, and we're then when we're retired and we, we're trying to learn to be present again at 75, why, why do we get pulled out of the present for so much of the middle? Is it possible that maybe if we practiced being present, if we practiced coming into the now, if we practiced simply challenging these thoughts about, ooh, I need this to be happy, instead of going, wait, what is missing in this now? That we could actually return to the joy of childhood, that we could have the peace of retirement in every moment. No matter what our task is, no matter what is missing from our socialized perception of our life, whether it is, I mean, what we consider now to be kind of poverty level was considered to be the American dream a, a generation or two ago. I mean, the American dream in the 50s was like a track house, you know, in a working refrigerator. Now, we, we have these insane ideas of what we need to be happy and live, you know, in luxury. And so we sacrifice our, our peace and huge percentages of our time to acquire this fleeting, vague belief that this, this thing, this stuff, will finally make us relax enough to be present and enjoy our life. So, if all these things aren't true, if the future and the security and the separateness aren't true, what is true? Hmm. Well, as I said, there's only now. The present moment is the only thing real. The path that got us here and the future potential are only ideas. And we need to be careful about how much of the now we sacrifice for futures that never happened or past that we can't change. If you can be present and visit those past and future as ways to, you know, as, as healthy ways, as healthy experiences, that's, that's the way we have to learn how to do it. But if, we're, if the now is simply passing by as we live in these, these potential futures, oh, that's tragic. So the now, the now is key. What else? There is only one thing. The universe, God, the flow, love, the cosmos, everything throughout time is all interconnected. Our human brains have a hard time comprehending that. We think of things very linearly. It's hard to imagine life without a cause and effect of things, but everything, cause and effect, is linked. Everything, everything is a Mobius slip. From what's happening right now is intimately connected to what happened during the Big Bang. Everything that is happening now has always been in potential or in, in history. So just as a, the, the cycle of a tree from acorn to seedling to oak, that is simply one thing. It is one process, the environment and the entity interacting with each other, well, not even interacting with each other. That process of interaction is what it is. It, it, you cannot stop it. You cannot pull things out of it. That all is interrelated. And everything in the universe is that way. Everything is just as important. Everything is built in. Like every cell has the DNA of an organism. Everything in the universe has the DNA of the universe. Let's see. Another one that we need to accept is security is a myth and death is inevitable. I was listening to David Data and he says that until a man can understand and know that everything that he creates and works for, every relationship he builds, everything he does will die and be destroyed, you can't be free. Because while you're trying to, while you're attached to permanence, you have attachment. 
You have fear based on losing things. You are acting not from a place of being present, but from a place of these false futures and pasts. It goes back to the idea of the Tao or the way. There's a, Ellen Watts talks about, to talk about the Tao or talk about the universe in this way is like, it is impossible. In the same way, you cannot eat your mouth. You cannot speak about the Tao. It is of it. Another truth that can inform us is the understanding that accepting impermanence and recognizing that suffering results when you wish things were different. So you need to embrace reality. And that process of embracing reality leads us to what I would say the path to the gift. The path of the gift is through gratitude and surrender. When you can start to snap into gratitude, start snap away from taking anything from granted, anything for granted, when you can start to recognize that being conscious, every experience, every visual stimulation, every sensation, every smell, every sound is a gift of infinite, infinite magnitude compared to non-consciousness. Every single thing is this massive gift. Well, that's this, I think that is the, the conscious path step towards enlightenment, towards the recognition that <gasps> this nirvana bliss of I am of it all and can witness it all and what a gift that is. I am experiencing the God consciousness. I am God's way of checking out this universe that I have created. And then surrender. Surrender, recognizing that the ego, the brain, this perspective that we have as a, as a, as a physical, if we, if, we, if we arbitrarily draw the line at our skin and say what's inside the skin is us, and that's other, which is false, because that's just one level. Everything is, everything is density. Inside our body is tons of microorganisms. Is that us? Where do we begin and, and the world end? If, if, I'm, if, if that plant is creating oxygen that I'm breathing, does, is it me when it's inside me? Or is, do I need that tree? Can I exist without the tree? So, but let's say that we have that separateness recognizing that my means of thinking, the, the 40 years that I've had to create logical thoughts or anything is grossly inadequate for charting a path through the world. Can I chart a path through our culture and the artificial construct of a capitalist system? Absolutely, that's what we do, that's the game we play. But that's not the game. The game has already got a flow going through it, already has a path that's going through it, already has a Tao, a way. And for us to truly sink into the gift, the bliss of living, we need to surrender. We need to have faith and recognize that the patterns, the alignment, the things that happen are governed by something beyond what we can create consciously and what we can think and what we can logically create. That there is a, a magnificent, amazing, miraculous balance, flow, and harmony to the universe. And that our individual role in all that, we have no idea, we have no way to judge if the things that happen to us are good or bad. We just have to have faith that that flow exists. And as we strip away our ego desires, as we strip away the beliefs, the false security we're chasing, as we, as we strip away and simply go deeper, deeper, deeper into what we are, hopefully getting more and more in tune with compassion, with love, with harmony, with interconnectedness of everything, then from that place we are called, we are pulled, we feel the flow, and then we can act from that place. Not from a, gonna make it happen, but from a, feel a call, feel a pull towards, with, a current. So from surrender and gratitude, 
we get to experience the gift. And from that place, there is no need to look for an afterworld. There is no need to repent. There is no need. There's simply the need to recognize that heaven is right now. And now. And as we share this moment, it is filled with gifts. And now, this one. And this one. And when we can share that with other people and our vibration and amplifies one another and we can recognize oh, we're all part of this gift. Ah, <sighs> oh, thank you for being a part of this gift. On behalf of Grandpa Caleb and all the love warriors, happy hug nation. Thank you for being here and amplifying this. I love you. Namaste. You only live once. Enjoy the color.